started. Um, I will come back around to where we were last time. I've written most of that up on the board, and I'll walk you through those steps that we've taken. I just want to recap a little bit about what we're doing. Central limit theorem says x bar minus the mean divided by standard error as n gets bigger goes to a normal 0, 1 distribution. It doesn't converge to a point. So it flutters around something. So it has that sort of variance if you square that. Um, so this is a statement about the mean. Statement about how the mean tends to behave under certain conditions. And so we're inclined to really like the mean because of this. We're inclined to jump to the mean all the time. I, I know about the central limit theorem. Let's analyze the mean. So don't even need a computer really to do it. So I could do it with tables. Played around with this in the 30s, no problem. So that's very attractive. Somebody give me some downsides to the mean. Means pool, right? Why use anything else? David? Uh, it's easily influenced by outliers. Easily influenced by outliers. And so what that might say is that um, that outline behavior might have so much variation in it that maybe this condition doesn't actually hold. Or maybe it just gets pulled around too fast. And so we've all seen that mean-based analysis induce a squared error sort of norm. We usually get them hand in hand. We'll see that through class. So means go hand in hand with squared error assumptions. Where variance comes from. We like doing calculus. Makes our life easier, but it comes at a cost. So we are assuming certain sort of loss functions. We use the mean to estimate something. We're assuming something about our penalty on how far we are away from the truth. We'll get around to that later in class when we get into estimators and decision theory. But there's some theory that tells us when not to use means. But as David said, we don't even need theory. We'll just see it in some practical examples. The mean is too simple. Um, this problem occurred in the homework. It was always a fun problem. So I'll remind you what this problem is. Somebody remind me what number is this from the book? 516? 5.20. Oh, 5.2. Comes early. Yeah, it's kind of daunting. It's like the second problem is already hard. So, and the goal is to work out this distribution right here. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. And so, conditional on x1, seeing that first. IID observation, they use this rainfall example, but I kind of like to focus on, this is just any IID distribution. So I can write down the density and I can write down its CDF. I do some fundamental theorem of calculus and stuff like that. And eventually after averaging over X1, I come up with this distribution. So we showed that last night in review session. So we'll work through these details in review session. Um, we almost got to this right at the end. We'll do another review session this next week if you guys want to catch up on ideas or thoughts. I'll issue some new homework problems, um, but they'll be due in about two weeks. So we'll stagger the review sessions so that it's not always just pressed up against your homework. But if you work this thing out right here, um, that the expected amount of time for my next observation, or for some observation to exceed the first thing, let me just draw you a picture of it. So I've got some distribution. I'm going to sample from an IID. Bang, there's my point. And so I'm asking this question how long do I expect to wait until we're bigger than this? But this is random and it fluctuates. So we want to deal with its stochasticity that it wasn't a fixed value. And we had an interesting conversation at the end of the night on this problem. And so I asked Eric, what's the probability that you think that you'll actually exceed your first value? So if we played this game, I went to any sampling distribution, 
I grab a value, I don't tell you what it is, anything like that, and I say, how many draws do you think it's gonna take me before I exceed that value? Um, in expectation, we expect an infinite number of draws. So, obvious question is, is what's the probability that it happens? Eric said, well, logically, if I just follow the English words, it's never gonna happen. That's what it means. And so I offered Eric a wager. So they can make a lot of money off of it. So we'll go to an IID distribution on my computer and we'll play this game. And if I'm still here at the end of the night simulating draws, I'll consider that infinity and you win the game. Otherwise, you owe me a bazillion dollars. And so we already know who's going to win. So I will win. And so this is, so it's kind of, it almost seems contradictory. I expect an infinite number of draws. Or I might say in expectation, the expected, expected value of this random variable n is infinity. Do those mean the same things to you? So we were mincing an English conversation with a technical mathematical one. So do I expect? I don't expect that to happen at all. But the expected value says it's infinity. But I don't expect to wait until tomorrow to draw a value bigger than the first. We can keep playing this game over and over and over again, and I'm gonna win. Let's just ask the question, if you followed this mathematics, Chin had a really good insight on this. What if I just ask the reverse question? How long do you think it would take until I see a value that's less? If you follow the mechanics in deriving that, it's going to be the same expectation. The expected value, there was nothing special about this being a bigger value in anything. So, same sort of problem. Just redefine success and failure and everything, and the math would work out the same. So, let's deal with that. What's the expected amount of draws that I need, so the expected number of iterations, samples that I need, before I'm bigger than the first draw. Infinity. What's the expected number of draws that I need until I get something less? Infinity. What's the problem? But I say it's going to happen, obviously. n equals to one, the probability is one half. Like, it's a lot. It's a lot, the odds are on your side. <laughs> I think so too. And I know something's gonna happen. How about we just say, what's the, <laughs> I'm gonna grab a value stochastically, randomly, IID from a distribution, and I ask this question, how much time do I need until I'm either smaller or greater? And you say, well, it's infinity on both sides, so. It'll never happen, but obviously it's going to happen on the first time. So that would be a false conclusion from this analysis as well. So the problem is what you think expectation is. So expectation is this mathematical thing. It's a weighted average over the random variable itself. And so if the distribution has really heavy tails, that thing oftentimes does not exist. And so for a lot of distributions, expectations do not exist. Heavy-tailed stuff. And so a lot of times we look at heavy-tailed stuff and we think, it looks pretty well behaved to me, so I glance at a Cauchy distribution. And I go, it looks a lot like a normal. If I plotted histograms, I might see, it looks kind of like a normal. You know, minus an outlier, I'll pluck that off. You're making a huge mistake when you do that. Model it by normal and then try to understand what the mean behavior of something is that doesn't even exist in the first place. So means don't always exist for every distribution. It's a super convenient, you know, sort of thing to think about, and I gave you a physics interpretation. I said if I had a metal bar, and the weights were described by the distribution, I stuck my thumb right where the expectation is, that's where the metal bar would balance, right? So. Give me the analog to the expectation not existing. What would that mean in terms of physical realities with the metal bar? I don't think it happens. 
Yeah, exactly. The bar ha would have to be infinitely long for this to happen. And so if I had an actual physical bar that had a length to it, it won't happen. But in these distributions where you have things going off to infinity, weird things can happen, especially if you accumulate mass too, too much into the tails. So you'd need this infinitely long bar to do it. And so that analogy breaks down. So sometimes your intuition doesn't quite hold on these things. So expectations we will find are sometimes really good estimators of things, and sometimes are really bad. So I want to develop theory for us in this class when we use what? So a lot of um, chapter seven will be about that. So just keep in mind, means aren't always the best thing. Oftentimes they are. But don't use a mean to characterize something when it's inappropriate. One case would be when variances don't exist. I'm trying to invoke the central limit theorem. Another case might be like this one right here. Where it's just a bad description of the problem. You want another one? Just since we're getting warmed up on expectations not existing? Why not? Let's just come to this in a second. This is kind of fun. So this problem, I think it's fun because it shows you about conditioning and teaches you a little bit about probability that you must, you might have missed. And it can be a challenging problem to work through all the steps. So I think the first time I did it, it took me a couple hours. So just to get an idea, I, I think I kind of remember sitting there for like three hours doing that when I first encountered this problem. So it can take a while. Now I do it in a minute because I know all the steps. Um, do you guys know the St. Peter Bart paradox? So this is just a side. Okay, let's play a game. Just think about um, a betting activity. So this problem was proposed a long time ago. One of the Bermudeleys came up with it. Um, we're going to play a game, and we're going to be flipping some coin. I'm going to make it a fair coin. Okay, so fair coin. So the probability of a head is equal to the probability of a tail is equal to a half. So nothing too weird about a coin. And I'm going to give you some amount of money if you decide to play this game. No matter what, you're going to walk out with some sort of a payout. And I'm going to ask you a question about how much would you pay to play this game for the opportunity to get paid. A lot of games are set up like this. And so I'm going to pay you one over two K dollars. where K is the observation first time a headache occurs. So I'm going to flip the coin until I see a head. And I'm going to count that. And I'm going to give you that many dollars. Actually, let's do this K minus one. Okay, so if we flip the coin, you see a head, k is 1, 1 half to the k minus 1, 1 half to the 0, which is 1. Pay your buck. If k is 2, that doesn't seem good. Let's pay you this much. Pay that much money. This is a better game. So if K is big, you win a lot of money. So if K is one, you win a dollar. If K is two, you win two bucks. If K is three, you win four bucks, eight bucks, sixteen bucks, thirty-two bucks, sixty-four bucks, one hundred twenty-eight, two fifty-six, five twelve, ten twenty-four, and so on and so forth. So that month, that number gets big fast. How much would you pay to play this game? And how would you even think about that? 
How about you, Adeline? You look like a, a better gambler. Maybe a dollar. That's the most risk adverse thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so you are not willing to lose any money whatsoever. So I'm, I'll only play if I break even. So fair enough. <laughs> Anybody else? Nobody will play the game with you, but fair enough. I don't want to play. <laughs> so the uh, challenge is not issued to Adeline. Ben? So, uh... Assuming I get to try as many times as I want to bet everything, right? If you get to, so I didn't say that you get to assume that. Mm -hmm. So, so. I, this is real life. So these are real utility functions. This is supposed to be a real question. So if there's no heads in the period of flips, you just lose your money? Is that little long? Eventually there will be a, a head, right? So eventually we'll get there. Rel can tell it tells us something about that if you're familiar with measure theory. Eventually it will happen. But as we just said, if you don't know how many works there are. There, that's right. So I'm going to generate. So if you want to think about it this way, how is k distributed? Do you know? We said it last night. Yeah. Geometric. So just draw from a geometric distribution. I can do it lightning fast. And you get that much of it. So, and we'll get a number back. You've never gone to a geometric <laughs> distribution. It's like, eh, not feeling it. It'll be a number. How much would you pay for? I, uh, whatever's in the wallet, whatever. What have you got? Let's <laughs> <laughs> $50. 50 bucks. Yeah. So, pay a lot. I'll play with you. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else? Four point two dollars. Is that what it is for me, Adam? That's a different number. <laughs> no. So I don't know of an analysis that gives you that. Obviously, there's a lot of answers right here. It's an open-ended question. How would you analyze this question? What if I asked you a similar question and I said something like, um, the odds of you winning some game, whatever the game is, that's what all these things are. They're just entertaining you in the middle that there's so probability that you win. It just drew random numbers and you didn't get to see anything you wouldn't play. And so it's just the mystery of it all. And so there's some probability of you winning a game, some probability of you losing a game, and I say that if you win, you get a dollar back. How much would you pay to play? Pretty easy economic setup. How might you answer that question? Expected value. Yeah, so Mohammed says, I'll look at the expected value and I will pay less than that number to play. I don't want to pay more than the expected wins. And Mohammed's kind of invoking something that Ben talked about that kind of thinking about this, I get to do it over and over and over again. You know, so maybe that's why we like that number. It's pretty rational explanation and I would probably do that too. Something like that. What's the expected value for this problem? No. So two to the k minus one is the amount of winnings. What's the probability for each one? One over two k. That's the probability of each k. So what is this number? Infinity. We'll diverge. Try to sum it up. So will you pay a little bit more than the expected value or the expected value? The expected value would tell you in this problem, just as another motivator. Um, Expected values aren't a very good tool in a problem when they don't exist or they're infinity. And so, so what, why are we only including the payout but not what you bet? Because I'm assuming you lose what you bet if you don't win. I'm just talking about the expected winnings right here. And so you can subtract off your dollar or whatever. So I'm just looking at the winnings and you can mentally subtract that off. 
famous problem, St. Petersburg paradox, basically a question about extrinsic values. Is this a good tool or analysis? Everybody jumps to it and clings to it. But in heavy tail distributions, you might not want to use that. So just as a warning shot, central limit theorem is incredibly important. But of course, means don't always exist, and they don't always characterize things. Bimodal distributions are a pretty good example of sometimes I don't want to characterize a distribution by a mean, even though it exists, but it's not where the mass of the distribution is. Can somebody else tell me uh, another example where a mean isn't a good characterizer? So when it doesn't exist, obviously, i.e. it's an infinity. When it's not in the mass of the distribution, what about other things like medicine, personalized medicine or something like that has been a big question. I go to the doctor and I'm in a place where they haven't done any clinical trials on people like me. And they say things like, well, on average, the thing has very little side effects. Every once in a while, people die and become schizophrenic off of this stuff. So is that a meaningful analysis to me, the whole population average? And so I always say no. So here's another question I always have, constantly asking myself this question because people ask me. So I ride a motorcycle on nicer days than today. And most people will say, you know what the odds are of you dying on that thing? And I always say, no, I don't. Do you? Are you do you know what it is? And they're, well, I've looked at these transportation reports, and I hear it's quite dangerous. So I'm getting lumped in with 19-year-old kids on sport bikes. So they're a big risk group, but their insurance is still high. And so am I like this? I don't know. Not sure what the answer is, but it's all about stratification. So sometimes averaging everything together is a really bad idea. Your insurance company is probably a good person to ask about your risk. <laughs> they, they have some weird things, and I'll, since I have multiple motorcycles, I can show you how hypocritical and bizarre and illogical this, their funding, their model is for insurance. Okay. They don't know anything about it. So, but. Yeah, they'll do little things like, I live in Giles, so my insurance rate went up 13 bucks because of who I'm being aggregated with. Uh, okay. Means, cool, but be careful. Back in the 30s, um, this is the only thing that was going on. Talk about other analyses. I did have this question about the central limit theorem. How fast? does this happen? And so what I mean is, what is the rate as a function of n in which this happens? So if n is 2, we don't expect x bar and some weird distribution to be normally distributed. They tell us in step 101 that if n is 30 or 31, we're safe. And I'm going to try to break you of that habit and show you a lot of Examples where not good enough. So we'll see examples like that pretty soon. Um, so if n gets big, this happens. And eventually, we never actually see infinity. We use it at a point. But how fast does this happen is a function of n. The answer is staring you at the face. What does x bar do? We don't need the central limit theorem. We need the law of large numbers. We know what it does. Convergence to, it converges to me right here. So this thing's going to zero. This must also be going to zero. It obviously is. How fast is this going to zero? It rates square root of n. So the answer to this is fast. as 1 over square root of n goes to 0. So that's a notion of a rate. How fast is that? We usually write this down as O n to the half, minus half. We might say there's some sort of 
um, upper bound, lower bound, exact bound, things like that, big O notation. And that's just going to be quantifying this rate. If you're into studying rates, that's pretty quick. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but it's pretty quick. Just some tidbits. Let's try to prove our statement. So we're not going to exactly prove this statement. Um, if you do ask, in what sense does this quantity converge in the stronger senses. So gets close to normal and it doesn't jump out. All we're going to show with our proof is that we converge to the distribution normal zero one, which is a little bit different of a statement. And so convergence and distribution, let's say I have a normal zero one right here. All I'm saying is that the samples are distributed like this. Not that they do anything specifically. Now, I'll give you an example of something that doesn't converge in any other sense than distribution, um, but converges in distribution. If you'd like to see that this is a pretty weak sense, uh, if I take a normal 0, 1 random variable, x, right here, and I look at its negative reflection minus x, so I draw from a normal 0, 1, and I take all of my values and I throw negative signs on them. Those values are not the same, x and minus x, but they're distributed the same. So x and minus x can be quite far away from each other. They're not converging to each other, but the distribution is still characterized the same. That's because it's centered in zero. So convergence and distribution is pretty much our weakest mathematical type of convergence that I care about. So there are things like convergence and expectation, and it's like, if you don't tell me anything about the distribution, I don't really care. So convergence and expectation doesn't do it for me as a statistician. But convergence and distribution as a practicing statistician is about all I really care about. Why? Why don't I? Like, it is true if somebody said, how does that converge? And I say, almost oh, well, surely. And I could quantify that, but we won't waste too much time on that in this class. And I go, but. I don't really care. I do care when I'm programming stuff and I want to see if values are getting close and if they jump out from something, then I go, ah, oh, there's a bug. Mathematically, it's not supposed to do that. I just want convergence out of the thing, but I can sometimes detect it. But why do I only care about prob probability distributions and if they converge to the right distribution? Because that's all I ever use. And so somebody asks me what's the probability of something and I say 0.8, and they go, how did it converge? <laughs> I've never been asked that. Nobody's ever asked that. And so, 0.8, still 0.8, regardless of how it's converged. So, I think that while this is a lightweight proof, maybe a little bit heavier than some of the proofs you've seen, um, it's good enough for practice. One final question before we get on. And so, you were saying that the convergence of the denominator depends on the square root of n, 1 over the square root of n as opposed to infinity. Yeah. But that also depends on the variance. So should I expect different distributions to converge at different values? <coughs> this thing is obviously causing the flutter in all of this. But as this converges right here, both the numerator and the denominator converge. So I can just look at one of them. I mean, so if, if I'm looking at means that are derived from data that are um, like from maybe a beta distribution, versus, let's say, an exponential distribution. They would not converge at the same rate. Asymptotically. So, asymptotically. You're right that, in practice, you'd notice a difference. You know, we're not accounting for constant. And so, yeah, that's why the asymptotic argument is weak. That it's not what actually happens, but eventually, they catch up and they stay at the same speed. So those constants do matter, and that's probably why I'm not a theoretician, because it's always like, that's all nice, but the constants matter. So yeah, good point, but still true. OK. So this is just a statement about convergence and distribution. Um, one more before I go to the proof. Proof is the least interesting part, probably. 
Somebody asked me this last night, and I, I went to sleep thinking about it just a little bit. I've seen this problem a lot of times. But somebody said, what if I looked at something like this, and where n, and I'll say the xi's come from some f, i, i, d, and the variance of this thing exists. Variance of my xi's is finite. Okay, so central limit theorem exists on that. But who was it? Somebody wanted to make this random. Let's just say this follows some distribution. I'll come up with some other name of a distribution, g. But this is discrete. Okay, so what might be a good distribution that you might use for n? Gamma would be a poor choice. You follow my view, you fail the first test. Plus on. We need something that counts. Counting numbers. Gammas are zero to infinity on the table. So maybe Poisson. And wanted to know does the central limit theorem still apply to this? Quantity. What do you think? Maybe. Certainly not what we're proving. But maybe. Anybody else? So n is random. Let's imagine this. I'll let you think about this just a little bit more. Let's imagine n came from this distribution. So n could either be 100. Or it could be 1,000. So let's say something bigger. Some big number. So still some random distribution. So I can always do these sort of very simple sanity checks. And so I'm going to get two groupings of x bars. Some that came from this, and some that came from that one. And the question is, is if I plotted those, would it look normally distributed? If I plotted the histogram of this and ran a simulator. So you could answer the question with the computer. What do you think? I don't think the central limit theorem holds on this. So I have two groupings of x bars under different ends. Some of them have real tight variances. Some of them have bigger variances. They're both estimating the same thing, though. So if I overlaid those two things, I would see basically two distributions centered <coughs> with different variances. <coughs> Sometimes with these sort of compound processes, hierarchical models, central limits theorem hold, or things like it can hold. But certainly for just a general problem where you set it up and you ask, does the central limit theorem hold for this? The answer is no, not in general. But oftentimes, we have these sort of weird hierarchical processes where central limit theorems hold. I'll give you a problem in the next homework that helps you examine this. Okay, enough verbiage. Let's do our proof. So our proof is, we're going to show that the moment generating function for this random variable, which is the same as this right here, just algebraically written differently. And so each of my yi's for just the xi's minus mu over sigma. It's just a one data point standardization. So same thing. We're going to study the moment generating function for this quantity that we're saying converges to a normally distributed thing, which is the same as that. So we'll write down the moment generating function. This is our random variable. And then we'll do some standard identity stuff. So I can slide the root n. If you remember the formula, what it looks like, I can take the root n, it's a scaling factor, and slide it over the t. And just group that over here. Because everything is iid, um, and I'm looking at e to the sum of the yi's t, that thing factorizes into a product of e's and the exponentials break into a pop or the expected values break into a product. They're all identically distributed, and so I can get rid of that i right there and just replace it with the n. They're all the same. They all have the same moment generating functions. And we'll show that this converges to this thing right here. So that'll be our punchline, and that's the moment generating function for a normal zero. 
think we've got enough time. So here's step one of the proof, Taylor expands. Okay. This is gonna be our approximation. Yeah. And this other part right here, I'll say this part, the whole upstairs will be our approximation. This part right here will be our remainder. So I'm gonna look up to the quadratic term in my approximation, and then we'll show that this remainder in the limit vanishes. And this is the only important stuff. Okay, so just Taylor's theorem written down. I'm gonna rewrite that. So m log t over root n. We'll eventually have to take a power of this. I'm not doing it right now. So I'm just gonna work on the interior of this and figure out what this thing is that will power it up. So this is m zero, just the function itself. I'm centering my series at zero. Some people call that McLaurin, but the only time I've ever heard anybody specify that is in Goodwill. is one because I'm dividing by its standard deviation. So the variance of xi is sigma squared. So when I knock that with the variance operator, it gets squared, they cancel each other out. We have variance one. So the variance of y is equal to the second moment of y minus the first moment squared. We know this is one. By design, we know this thing is zero because of what we just found. So that must be right here. So that's one problem. Let's rewrite this. I have a question. Yes, please. What happened to all the factorials? Thank you, man. So, absolutely. Zero factorial. Good there. One factorial. Good there. Two factorial, which is two. Thank you very much. Times 
squared over root n. This will square this whole thing. And then Ben reminds us to divide by 2 factorial, which is just 2, plus remainder. I like to remind myself there's an n in there. This is operating as a function of n as well. And so that's our whole thing right there. Question is, is, is this series any good? Does it converge? We need to check what Taylor told us, that this is a valid series that we can use, i.e. the remainder term is dying off towards zero relative to this thing right here. And all we have to do is check the first two terms. So our remainder right here is just k is equal to 3 to infinity. This is going to be m k is 0 y k factorial. And then I'm going to have t over root n to the k. Does have anything to do with n, this first part? Nothing. It's constants. There's no n's in there. And so we don't care about that stuff. We don't know what the numbers are. It depends on the distribution. But it's not relevant to us. So not a function of n. I like to just notice that in the uh, smallest term in here. Um, is related to k is equal to 3. And so what we need to do is we just need to look at t over root n. k is equal to, well, I'll just write down 3. And I need to compare it to this term right here. I'll do it the other way. Add a note. Taylor says a props is good if this converges to zero. just want to verify that. So how many ends are right here? It's just one. It goes up here. How many ends get left over? There's still a half n over there once it knocks it out. And it winds up in the denominator. So this goes to zero. Let's just write it out. So n t write down, it's going to be t cubed, t squared, this will be n3 <laughs> right here. This is just t over square root of n. Zero. And so asymptotically as n gets big, the remainder falls off. That's what we show. And they talk about that a little bit in the book, but they're really just doing your calc exercise where they ask you to check things. So, in which radius does this hit? for all of them? So, this is always happening. So, reasonable approximation. Okay. Now we're going to power everything up. So, this just says that this will be a reasonably well behaved Taylor series. <laughs> Technical check. function or a function that we're looking at, t is going to be equal to 1 plus t squared, ah, and I hit it again, so 2.
squared plus my remainder. And I'm going to raise this power. So I can rewrite this as 1 plus t over 2, 1 over n. I'm going to write it like this plus n r t root n. And the question is, is what does this limit converge to? And you may know the answer to that. Let me just ask a question about this part. What does this converge to as a function of n? Kind of have to impute in that cubic term. So this is the exact same thing we just did before that we got an n multiplied by r and we showed that it converged to zero. So this goes to zero, actually. That's not a good enough argument to just say that we can take it out right now. But this thing converges to this. We're going to write it down in two steps. So 1 plus 1 over n. There's a square. t squared over 2 plus r t root n. chapter 4 that shows you that this limit right here is that limit. So I can take this thing and just plug it right here. So as you remember before, this was just an interesting expression for E where this was just a dummy argument. X, when I first wrote it down, that same argument goes right here. It turns out if this part converges to zero, just in any sense, it vanishes in here. So just remember what this thing will do right here. This factorizes in the product of two e's. If this is going to zero, how fast is e to that thing going to zero? Fast, even faster. And so this converges to e to the t squared. And we're done. Let's imagine. So voila. Central limit here. So you can check in chapter four. They'll just redirect you to your calculus book if you want to learn about. So I, I looked at it. What's their argument? Most calculus books have this. You know, but this is a limit that I've learned many times. So kind of a nice thing. So kind of magical. It does happen. So this is a phenomena that Gauss and others. I should say, it wasn't just him. He figured out that taking averages, you plot those things, that histogram looks normally distributed. This is one such proof of that. So all we care about is the shape. So pretty cool. Maybe the most powerful theorem in all statistics. Certainly not modern statistics, but it's still underlying a lot of stuff to do. So regression effect, what's happening with regression models, it's all dictated by this. Any questions about this? Eric? So, okay. you say that thing goes to zero? Yeah, it goes to zero. Then, wouldn't e to the power of that go to Oh, no, never mind. Yeah, right. Yeah. Factor e to the zero is one multiplied by one. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, you can check it out. We had already showed it when we ended up doing the ratio of the cubic term to the quadratic term, that it really was n times r 
that was driving that thing to zero. So that's it. So I think next time we're going to come back and we're going to get into order statistics. So we'll change the game a little bit. Sometimes means aren't the only characterizer. Sometimes I want to know about quantiles of the distribution. So the mean is one such quantile. Sometimes I want to know things towards the end. You know, what are some big quantiles, the 75th quantile? How do you estimate that? So a different descriptor of the distribution. It's a lot harder because I have to know what the distribution is to write it down. If I know what the distribution is, then maybe I can do it. For central limit theory, things are better because I don't need to know what the distribution is. We'll come back there. Read through those examples. The distribution of a joint order step. Try to read that over the weekend. And if you're thoroughly confused once you get through it, I think I can make some. Thanks, guys.